to you about lifestyle medicine. Both Dr. Meisel and I are board certified in lifestyle medicine, and when we meet another doctor that knows what lifestyle medicine is, we know exactly what we're talking about. All of you should go to your physicians and tell them about lifestyle medicine. They should look up the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. It takes about six months to study for the boards. This is a picture of me talking to my grandchildren about the human microbiome. Okay? And they're listening. What, what is the role of the OBGYN in preventing and treating obesity? A lot. Every doctor in every field is dealing with it now. The only problem I have with this doctor, don't touch the mic, right? No, that's not. I apologize. There's mincha going on outside, so it might be ladies only for a little bit in here. If anybody needs to dive in mincha. Okay. Well, it happens to be the first time I'm speaking in front of men, by the way. <laughs> now, now it's happening again. Well, I think we're going to have to move on, right? Okay. So this doctor who is a, a big shot, excuse me, at Harvard, he writes in his editorial, um, the intervention should include calorie-restricted diet, doesn't work. Exercise, not really the main thing. Metformin, nobody wants to take a pill. And sleeve gastrectomy, sorry, I don't want to be cut up. So we have to do a little better than the simplified understanding of what's going on in our specialty. The name of my talk is Harmony and Science in Plant-Based Eating, and I hope to convince you tonight that it all fits in together. It's all interlocking and it's all meaningful. Question, select the most important factor that will improve, improve blood sugar control. Protein, fat, water, exercise, or fiber? You don't have to, oh, we have an oriented audience here. Okay, I'm gonna go. Now this, you're gonna find that at the end. Okay. This slide I'm donating to Nefesh the Nefesh. If you look at the red line, the United States is doing absolutely the worst in terms of healthcare expenditures and longevity. We are spending the most and we have the worst outcomes in terms of healthy and long life. Now, if you look, Israel, who is spending almost the least, is doing pretty well. They're right up there. Okay? Meet George Mann, my father-in-law. He is so-called uh, blue zoner. The blue zones are the parts of the world where people live the longest and the healthiest, up to age 100, and my father-in-law just celebrated his 100th birthday. Now, my father-in-law has been eating beans for 40 years. At the time, they called it the Pritikin diet. Everyone thought he was crazy, and he's outlived everybody. His peers are all at least 15 years younger than him. And I ignored him my, almost my entire marriage. Um, this is my great-grandmother, Molly, who I'm named after. You can see what kind of genes I inherited. Everyone sees that. And that's me. That's me. I think I look a little better now. I hope so. Thank you. This is the book that I read that changed me, Proteinaholic by Dr. Garth Davis. He is a bariatric surgeon. He treats obesity with surgery. And he really realized that it's about lifestyle. He still does the surgery, though. I read the book in overnight. I just totally changed my life. Now, in the coaching world, you have stages of readiness for change. I went straight to action. I was over ready. I was taking a statin. I didn't really understand why. Both my parents had open heart surgery. But the day that I read that book, I threw my statin in the garbage pail. I went to educate myself. All the years of board recertification every year in OBGYN, never did they once offer an article on lifestyle medicine. I had to start from scratch. So I took the T. Colin Campbell course and I got my certificate, but you know what? It was not enough and I had to become board certified in lifestyle medicine, which I did in November 2020. 
I also am on the board of directors of Plant Powered Metro New York, which is headed up by Liana Levine Reisner. And I have some swag from her, if you want to have my back. It's an amazing, amazing organization, and they exist to empower people from anywhere on the planet Earth who want to change your lifestyle. So I thought I won this. Um, change your play, transform your health, okay? And we also did an article in Vina Magazine, Almost Vegan Becomes Medical Vogue. It was written by Rona Lewis. I want to thank her and tell you all that she did not twist my words around. It was great. Now, what are we doing here? There's a diabetes epidemic all over the world, but especially so in Haredi society. And it's not only diabetes. You can cross that out and put any chronic disease. And Dr. Meisel enumerated all of these chronic diseases. They're here, we're dealing with them every day, and we really need to do something about it. The question is, why are we in this situation? Well, let's talk about some of the reasons why we might be. This is one of them. We, we teach our children early on that we reward them with ultra-processed junk, excuse me. Okay, this is my own grandson. And then when you're a teenage girl and you want to go to Claire's, which is a teeny bopper store for accessories in the mall, all of a sudden I took my granddaughters there and I saw, why is there a cereal in the teeny bopper store? Well, guess what? This is makeup. When your teenage daughters learn how to apply makeup, they can think about Cocoa Puffs and make sure that they're putting on makeup and eating Cocoa Puffs. Or how about this that I just saw in the airport? This is a new product in the airports in the United States. Chicken skin chips. Okay? And, and if you look down, it says there, 100% happiness guaranteed. Okay? Low carb, keto friendly, high protein, gluten free. This is what is going on in the United States. Or maybe after you deliver at Maimonides Medical Center and you go upstairs to postpartum, here's your gift basket that you're given while women who are trying to establish their milk supply. So we have a lot of work to do here. And we also want to know why we need to do it. So I'm going to give you a little short science lesson. Just hang in there. It doesn't last too long. Right, Deborah? Okay. Uh, there are plant cells and animal cells. We are, we are made up of animal cells. Uh, all cells have a nucleus, which is the brain of the cell, and the cell membrane, which keeps everything inside. Plant cells, in addition, have, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the dark green around it, it's called the cell wall, and that's made of what we understand as fiber or roughage, and that's what helps the plant stay upright. We have bones. Plants have cell walls. In addition, plants need energy. We get energy by eating. Plants get energy from the sun. We um, make proteins. We ingest proteins and we disassemble and reassemble to the proteins that we need. What plants actually do is they take nitrogen out of the soil and they make proteins for themselves. So these are just some little fun facts to remember. Briefly, the digestive tract. We chew, we swallow, the stomach does a lot of propulsion, digests some more, and then there are small loops of bowel in the middle there where we finish digestion, absorb all our nutrients, and then anything that we cannot digest or that we're going to eliminate as waste goes into the large colon and eventually comes out of the body. What we have learned in recent years is kind of astounding that we have something called a microbiome that is bacteria and other microorganisms that live in us and on us and these bacteria digest our leftovers. <clears throat> the health of the microbiome is very important. The more microorganisms you have and the greater diversity of microorganisms that you have is directly correlated with health. This is a close-up picture in color of the gut wall, the large intestine. The blue represents the intestinal cells, 
The green is protective mucus between the lumen or the space inside the colon. And all these sprinkles that you see are the bacteria. So you see that the mucus is a protection of all of the lumen, which is really, quote, the outside of the body, because what we eat and swallow remains separate from our body by staying in the lumen. I'm going to explain that a little more. Yeah. Now, does anybody, peanuts? You grew up with peanuts? Okay, so this is, I, I think of pig pen, this is pig pen, he's a cute kid. If you think of us in terms of the microbiome, we have bacteria everywhere. We're like a walking cloud of bacteria, viruses, and other types of microbes, and this is normal. We don't have to wash it away. It's normal, it's healthy, and it's appropriate. We also know if the microbiome is disturbed, that leads to chronic illness. And here is listing some of the chronic diseases that are associated with a disturbance of the microbiome. I'm not gonna read it, you can read it yourself. Now, let's get back to that photograph that I showed you before. This is actually a mouse experiment. Here is the first mouse up there. He's eating his mouse chow, he's very happy and his green mucus layer is quite thick. The next mouse was fed ice cream and donuts, literally, and you can see that his green mucus layer became thin, and actually there's a break in the mucus. The yellow represents debris, and you can see debris going to the other side of the mucus and approaching the body itself, and that's what's called a leaky gut, and that's why we have so many people with digestive issues because due to our fiber deficient diet and also due to our lack of fermented foods, which is another subject, we're experiencing leaky gut where kind of schmutz gets in and it sets off an inflammatory response in the body because the body is not meant to deal with this type of college schmutz or debris. This is Dr. Sonnenberg, by the way. She's here. I would, I'm going to talk a little more about their lab out in California. So what's human chow? This is human chow. Fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole grains, beans, peas, and lentils, and very little of everything else. Let's just talk a little bit more about what happens when you eat a whole food. Now here's a picture of wheat. You eat the wheat, some of it you can digest and absorb, and some you can't digest and you can't absorb, and it travels down into the colon, but guess what? The bacteria can digest the, these fibers, and they produce something called short-chain fatty acids. Does everybody see what that is? Is the web Okay, okay, let me do this. Huh? Okay, wheat, fermentation by bacteria, short-chain fatty acids. If you want to be healthy, you have to make short-chain fatty acids. Okay, and you hear all these terms being thrown around, prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics, right? We're busy ingesting, we're busy ingesting probiotics, but we also have to think of the prebiotics. And really the truth of the matter is that we have a lot of microbes down there and they need to be given a chance to digest the fiber. So the prebiotics are the fiber that supports beneficial microbes present in the gut. Probiotics are live microorganisms that provide health benefits. And the postbiotics, which is sort of a new catchy term, are the products made by bacteria that affect a range of physiologic processes. And here are some of the processes that are affected, and this is really important. Protects the gut, protects overall health, it's anti-inflammatory, improved metabolism of glucose and fat, improved immunity, and it guides angiogenesis, which is the formation of new blood vessels. It also aids in stem cells, which are these undifferentiated cells that can be called upon by the body to, form, uh, to perform different tasks. 
So really what's going on in your bowels, there's sort of a competition going on. You have the useful bacteria that love to digest fiber and make those short chain fatty acids for you. And then you have the, the bad boys, we, not a lot, and we hope that we're not eating lots of animal products to cause those colonies to get bigger and stronger. But they love to digest the animal leftovers and this leads to inflammatory states and is disease promoting. So when we think about eating plant-based, then people come to you and say, well, where do you get your protein from? So the answer is, well, where do you get your fiber from? And any patient who comes to me and says, I went to this nutritionist and she told me what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna, I said, did the nutritionist mention fiber to you? No, I said, time for new nutritionist, okay? This is a very interesting product that you can buy from Pleasant Hill Grain, they're in the United States. They show what happens when you take apart the whole grain and what you're left with at the end of the processing. You start with the first vial, it's the whole wheat kernel. What do we do when we eat, I just made on Friday for my family, bright white flour. You know, you could buy that in the Macaulay, bright white flour. So first the bran is removed, then something called middlings, which I didn't know what it was. It's stuff that they feed to horses usually. And the wheat germ, which is the baby, which is gonna be the next wheat. And then there's oils in there, valuable healthy oils, which are also removed. You remove all of this when you eat bright white flour and you're missing out on so much nutrition. Now it is true there are some that cannot handle the fiber, but you could, and I do it, believe it or not, I mill my own grains and I make my own flour. And according to the individual who's going to eat it, you could sift it coarser or finer. But why would you want to throw all these nutrients away or give them as animal feed? In fact, the scientific community thinks that whole grains are so important that they've given it a special name called microbiota accessible carbohydrates. It's meant for all of us. So this is also taken from Dr. Barnard's website, Build Your Plate. And we know we need to eat fruits, we know about the vegetables, but we do need to eat the whole grains and we have to take off the animal protein and put beans on the plate. But let's say we're not doing that well. Let's say we're not as healthy, which is a lot of us. We want to restore our microbiome. So how do we do that? We want to improve our diversity. We want to eat, yes, some fermented foods. And I'm going to tell you about a recent experiment, which is very interesting. And also, if you have trouble digesting, you may need to sprout some of your foods. So this same group, it's a Sonnenberg husband and wife, Christopher Gardner, they published a landmark paper a couple of years ago, and they actually used people, not mice. So what they did was they took two groups of people. In one group, they fed them large amounts of fiber-rich food. In the other group, they fed them a lot of fermented foods. I'm not gonna get into the details of which fiber and which ferment, you're welcome to read the study. Before they did the intervention, they took stool samples and they characterized the microbiome. Scientists could do this nowadays. They can look and analyze a microbiome. And they had different groups of people, those who had a more healthy microbiome and those who had a less healthy microbiome in their stool sample. And they also call it more industrialized or sanitized because we're always washing and et cetera, et cetera. So here are the findings of the study, and this is my only wordy slide, so please forgive me, but I really want everyone to understand because the findings are very revealing. Let's first go with the fermented foods. Everyone did well. The investigators were able to observe an increase in different types of bacteria in the stool. Not only the type that they ingested in the fermented food, but also bacteria that were likely there in very small, undetectable numbers, but somehow they were able to thrive and grow due to the changed environment brought about by the fermented foods. 
And in their bloodstream, they were able to show that the markers of inflammation decreased. How many people understand what I just said? Okay, not bad, thank you. Now, the fiber-rich arm, they had two types of responders. Those who had a healthy, strong microbiome did great. Those who had a weaker microbiome, less diverse, they found in the stool undigested fibers, and in those same patients, the markers of inflammation went up. They couldn't handle it. So this suggests that fermented foods, which increase microbial diversity, may need to be given before or together with the beneficial fiber-rich foods to get maximum health benefits from fiber. Which means, Anglos, Americans, North Americans, whatever you want to call us, Ashkenazi Jews, all of us, we're just not used to fermented foods. And we don't have to go overnight like in this study where they gave six servings a day. But it's something we have to look into. It's, it should be on our agenda in addition to high fiber or fiber rich foods. Now, what happens when you try to do this is I get this all the time. Doc, I can't eat that healthy food. It doesn't agree with me. Or I don't like beans. Okay, so I used to say to the patients, it's not you talking when you say, I don't like beans. It's your microbiome talking, okay? And this study really, really validates that. We have to push through a little bit. Dr. Michael Greger, how many of you heard of him? Nice Jewish boy, dedicated his life to nutrition research. Okay, so he makes it easy. Here's your daily dozen. Nowadays, he says he likes to put some mushrooms in there as part of his daily dozen. And uh, he fermented foods has salt, you can argue it. That's not the purpose of this talk. <laughs> the purpose of this talk is to, is to really um, focus on how can I on board? How can I on board? And he is very helpful for that. I just want to focus on one vegetable where it says here cruciferous vegetables. Does anybody know what cruciferous vegetables are? Great. We're preaching to the choir tonight. Okay. The cruciferous are the cabbage vegetables, and a Dr. Paul Talley down in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins, he was sort of the premier researcher on this, and he's the broccoli researcher and broccoli sprouts and all the health benefits that you can gain. What happens with cruciferous vegetables, they actually turn on the body's own ability to fight and prevent cancer and other chronic diseases. And there is, uh, how, how it happens, I'm not gonna go into that tonight. I have some more slides that I didn't show tonight than I am showing. How are we doing on time? We doing okay? Let's go. Commonly available cruciferous vegetables in Israel, brand new slide. Cabbage, kohlrabi, turnips, radishes, broccoli, cauliflower, mustard, horseradish. And in my opinion, the best vegetable to ferment, especially for beginners, is kohlrabi. I'm not gonna talk now about how or why. Yes. Okay, now I'm just going to, before I get to my favorite subject, which is beans, if you didn't figure it out already, um, I'm, I want to talk a little bit, two or three other points. So, can you give a baby a stalk of celery? You can't. Does a baby have a microbiome? Yes. Yes. The baby acquires its microbiome from its mother, basically. So that's why all women should eat healthy when they're pregnant, right? You want your babies to have a healthy microbiome. But if there are bacteria and other microbes in the baby's gut, how are they going to eat, right? Babies are not chewing on celery. And so what they have discovered is something called HMO, human milk oligosaccharides. I'll say it again, human milk oligosaccharides. This is basically fiber, inside the mother's milk that is just for the bacteria. Babies do not have enzymes to digest these human milk oligosaccharides. The, the female species has genes to encode, to produce food for bacteria. I hope you will understand how amazing that is. Okay, so here's a drop of human milk. It's mostly water. 
It has protein, skip the yellow, we're gonna to get to that after, that's the HMOs. Protein, lipids, which is the fats, and the sugar is called lactose. And a substantial amount of human milk is food for the bacteria in the baby's colon. Now, what do you think the manufacturers of baby formula are trying to do right now? They're trying to reproduce these HMOs. But how many are there? More than 200. Do you think they're gonna be able to do that? They're not. They're maybe gonna be able to do one or two or three, a handful. And then they're gonna put it on their label. We have HMOs. So I say to mothers, even if you can only nurse once a day, or even whatever you choose, do it. Because not only is it good for the microbiome, these HMOs, and I don't, I'm not showing this slide, but they leak into the body. Actually, the baby's large bowels are a little leaky, but they allow these HMOs in, and they circulate in the bloodstream, knocking on the baby's immune system. They're almost like vaccines, and they say, hi, I'm the friendly HMO, wake up immune system. And that's how the baby's immune system develops as well. It's a fascinating subject. So that's one point. And then you can't give a talk on whole food plant-based without mentioning sugar. Um, Dr. Robert Lustig, anyone heard of him? I want to tell you he's not as well known. He is a basic researcher, um, a bit of a ego, nice Jewish boy. <laughs> but he's done ground, groundbreaking research. And basically what he points out is that added sugar tends to poison the mitochondria which is the energy powerhouse of the cell. And added sugar also leads to liver fat, insulin resistance, diabetes, all sorts of chronic diseases. So he has a YouTube, excuse me, uh, called Sugar and the Bitter Truth, only for married people to watch because he has to tell jokes as well. But it's already had 23 million views. And I do recommend it. Okay, so his main message is protect the liver by avoiding added sugar and feed the gut. Okay, protect the liver and feed the gut. I will also acknowledge, because people always ask this, what about this, and what about oil, and what about, what about yogurt, and what about sardines? More research is needed, and research is being done, but we're never gonna truly get our answer. So that's why I say to my patients especially, and there's a Dr. Pam Popper who says, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. If you're 95%, that is amazing. That's amazing. <coughs> the sicker you are or the you know, more health problems that you might have, aim for 100%. Okay, whatever you do, it's going to help. And now we're gonna talk about my favorite subject, which is beans. Because if you're not eating beans, you're not doing it right. A lot of my patients come to me, they say, I'm sorry, I cannot do it. I say, well, what are you eating? They tell me what they're eating. They're not eating beans, I can't. We need to transition to a bean-oriented society. The Sephardim are much, much better at it than we are. I don't know how many Sephardic Jews do we have in the room, hooray. Okay, good. Um, this slide was prepared by Devorah Shulman, who is actually giving a workshop later on swaps. And I asked her to do this. We work together. We are a team. I try to motivate my patients, and then I ship them off to Devora to get it going because it's a challenge. So these are different prepared beans that you can buy in the United States of America. You have Moroccan. You have all kinds of soups. You have Mexican flavors. You have shelf-stable beans. Um, Eden brand, for example, they have dishes from all over the world in their cans. You have um, bio-Italian lentils in a can. You have, now getting to the more Middle Eastern beans, you have tormuz, which is a bean that's commonly eaten here in the land of Israel, which North Americans don't know anything about. It happens to be a bean that is second in protein only to soy. And you can get it very commonly in any store that sells dried beans in a bag. You also have full Nitsri or um, Egyptian full is the next. And you have tofu, and now you have something called pomfu in the United States, which is tofu made from pumpkin seeds. So 
There's a lot of choices out there. I have to tell you that say for one or two, I, I left at Sea Point Farms, roasted edamame, very good on your way to a wedding. Eat some of those roasted edamame and then you leave the chicken cutlet on your plate. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are solutions. We're all about solutions here. So if anyone's interested in starting any of these businesses here, please. Okay. The Rockefeller Foundation has picked up on the need for beans and other plant-based nutrition. And they're even focusing on children. So they have made certain goals. And you can see here, they're all plant-based goals for all over the world. And finally, finally, the United Nations caught up and they have started a campaign called Beans is How. It's like Jeopardy. I have the answer on my shirt. What's the question, right? The, the, the um, question is, how can we fix everything? Answer, beans is how. Okay, so this is a campaign to fix the future by doubling global bean consumption by 2028. How can we fix the future? How can we end malnutrition? How can we enjoy meals that don't cost the earth? How can we tackle climate change from the dinner table? I'm not a card-carrying vegan, but we have to be aware of it. We have to be aware of the reality of it. This was launched in November 2022, this campaign. Beans are a simple, affordable solution to our global financial health and climate problems. I'm out of time. They're nutritious, affordable, climate-friendly, versatile. They store and keep well, farmer's friend, delicious. Okay, we don't know they're delicious because we don't know how to cook them. But people who know how to cook them, they know they're delicious. Now, I don't know why the UN put if we're successful. We hope they'll finally be successful, but these, these slides are from the United Nations. Beans improve malnutrition rates, they support affordable, healthy diets, and they do reduce the impact on climate change. And they have invested millions and millions, and they have all sorts of fancy people on their bean board. Um, <laughs> seriously. Dr. Andy Jarvis, director of the Future of Food from Bezos Earth Fund. Okay, we're almost done. We're at Bean Champions, the bean team. There's a little bean there if anybody wants a bean job. Okay. okay, to summarize and wrap it up. What we need, parental resolve, school cooperation, cultural overhaul, and we need the involvement of the kosher food industry, community leadership, and champions to guide us. Okay, this slide is a slide from Wolfgang Mach, who invented the Mach mill. You can get a mill and mill your own grains in your home, on your kitchen counter, it costs about 350 American dollars, and you can get it with a plug that will fit the land of Israel. And this is one of his slides. Now, please eat food with fiber and SPS. SPS stands for specialized I forgot already, but I think I have it written down here. Meaning that these specialized products inside of, of grains, you can't take them apart. They all work together in concert. Last, second to last, what is Project 10K? Does everybody know the Weizmann Institute? Yes. <laughs> yes. The Weizmann Institute is starting a project. They're in the middle of it. They're recruiting men and women ages 40 to 70. And their goal is to take stool samples, examine microbiomes, uh, give everyone um, a glucometer that can measure their blood sugar, and a food diary. And they're going to use artificial intelligence to try to come up with the optimal diet for every single human being, because everyone is different. So if you want to join, you can look on their website. Precision nutrition, personalized nutrition. OK, everybody knows the answer to the question now. Fiber, because fiber slows down the absorption of sugar into your bloodstream. I hope you can hear this. Oh, we turned off the sound? Okay, let's turn the sound on. Okay, I have to start over. So let me go like that. Let me... Ladies and gentlemen, please. What? Thank you very much. We still don't hear. Close that. X. Okay. 
Oh, no, forget it. Okay, I'll just be my granddaughters. My three-year-old granddaughter, she wanted to draw a picture of a microbiome. So, it's true. It's not staged. So my daughter said to her, how does a microbiome look? So she went like this and she said, the microbiome, it's in the tummy. Okay? No one is too young to learn. Thank you very much.